Hi everyone, this is Doc Ina and this is my lecture on abortion. To download my lecture deck, please go to my WordPress site, Doc Ina Obigayne. Reference for this lecture is Williams Obstetrics, Chapter 18, Abortion. And this is the outline of my lecture. So abortion is defined as the spontaneous or induced termination of pregnancy before fetal viability. Its formal definition is pregnancy termination before 20 weeks AOG or termination of a pregnancy with a fetus born weighing less than 500 grams. Miscarriage and abortion are terms used interchangeably in a medical context. Other terms that are synonymous with abortion are early pregnancy loss, wastage, or pregnancy failure. Spontaneous abortion includes threatened, inevitable, incomplete, complete, and missed abortions. Septic abortion is abortion that is accompanied by signs of infection or with fever. Recurrent abortion is a repetitive spontaneous abortion. Induced abortion, on the other hand, is surgical or medical termination of a live fetus that has not reached viability. So what is the pathogenesis of first trimester spontaneous abortions? More than 80% of spontaneous abortions occur within the first 12 weeks of gestation, and this is closely linked to fetal chromosomal abnormalities. Death is usually accompanied by hemorrhage into the decidua basalis, followed by adjacent tissue necrosis that stimulates uterine contractions and expulsion. The key to determining the cause of early miscarriage is to ascertain the cause of fetal death. Approximately half of miscarriages are unembryonic. That means the pregnancy has no identifiable embryonic elements or what we call blighted ovum. The other 50% are embryonic miscarriages which commonly display a developmental abnormality of the zygote, the embryo, the fetus, or at times the placenta. Of embryonic miscarriage, half of these or 25% of all abortices have chromosomal abnormalities and thus are aneuploid abortions. Autosomal trisomy is the most frequently identified chromosomal abnormality. Monosomy X or 45X is the single most frequent specific chromosomal abnormality. Autosomal monosomy is rare and incompatible with life. Triploidy is often associated with hydropic or molar placental degeneration. Tetraploid fetuses most often abort early in gestation and they are rarely live-born. Chromosomally normal fetuses abort later than those that are aneuploid. Maternal factors that put the patient at high risk for abortion include the following. Older maternal age, maternal infection such as chlamydia trachomatis, medical disorders such as diabetes mellitus, thyroid disease, celiac disease, anorexia, bulimia nervosa, IBD, SLE. Some medications that may cause abortion, cancer, and malnutrition. Also included in maternal factors are surgical procedures. Surgical procedures performed during early pregnancy do not increase the risk of abortion except if it involves early removal of the corpus luteum or the ovary in which it resides. If performed before 10 weeks age of gestation, then we have to give supplemental progesterone. Between 8 and 10 weeks AOG, a single 150mg intramuscular injection of 17-hydroxyprogesterone caproate is given at the time of surgery. If performed between 6 to 8 weeks, um, then 2 additional 150mg 17-hydroxyprogesterone caproate is given at the time of surgery. Other progesterone regimens that we can give include oral micronized progesterone or an 8% progesterone vaginal gel. Other maternal factors include social and behavioral factors, including smoking, alcohol, excessive caffeine consumption, occupational and environmental factors, immunologic factors such as APAS, inherited traumophilias, and uterine defects. So this is the clinical classification of spontaneous abortion. 
Threatened abortion is when the patient manifests with bloody vaginal discharge or bleeding that appears through a closed cervical os during the first 20 weeks. The fetus is viable on ultrasound. So, in a threatened abortion, the cervix is closed and the uterus is compatible to age of gestation. Inevitable abortion is when a patient experiences gross rupture of the bag of waters or the membranes along with cervical dilatation. Incomplete abortion is when a patient bleeds following a partial or complete placental separation and dilatation of the cervical os. And complete abortion is when a patient presents with history of heavy bleeding and passage of meaty tissues, cramping, and um, on ultrasound, there is little or no placental or products of conception that is left. For mid-trimester abortion, this is end of the first trimester until the fetus weighs about 500 grams or gestational age reaches 20 weeks. The risk factors for second trimester abortion include race, ethnicity, prior poor obstetrical outcomes, and extremes of maternal age. And mid-trimester abortion is closely linked to recurrent miscarriages. Cervical insufficiency is also one of the more common causes of repeated abortion or recurrent pregnancy losses, and this is also known as incompetent cervix. This is characterized classically by painless cervical dilatation during the second trimester. It can be followed by prolapse and ballooning of the membranes into the vagina and ultimately expulsion of an immature fetus. Risk factors include the following, previous cervical trauma such as dilatation and curettage, conization, cauterization, or amputation. Transvaginal sonography documents cervical shortening of less than 25 mm or less than 2.5 cm. So how do we manage cervical insufficiency? We manage this surgically using a cerclage, which reinforces a weak cervix by a purse string suture. Contraindications to cerclage usually include bleeding, uterine contractions, or ruptured membranes. Prophylactic cerclage before dilatation is preferable, but a rescue or emergency cerclage can be performed after the cervix is found to be dilated or effaced. As for the timing of surgery, elective cerclage is best done between 12 and 14 weeks AOG. So basically, we have two kinds of cerclage procedures. There's the McDonald and the Shirodkar procedure. For the McDonald cerclage procedure for incompetent cervix, we start uh, the cerclage procedure with a number 2 monofilament suture being placed in the body of the cervix very near the level of the internal os. Then, continuation of the suture placement in the body of the cervix is done so as to encircle the, the whole cervical os. So, in this case, in the letter C, the image at letter C, we see that the encirclement with the suture around the whole cervical os is completed. So, the suture is tightened around the cervical canal sufficiently to reduce the diameter of the canal to around 5 to 10 millimeters or less. And then the suture is tied. The effect of the suture placement on the cervical canal is apparent. A second suture placed somewhat higher may be of value if the first is not in close proximity to the internal os. Now, this is the Shirodkar procedure or the modified Sherrod Garcer Clodge for incompetent cervix. So in, in this procedure, a transverse incision is made in the mucosa overlying the anterior cervix and the bladder is pushed cephalad. A 5 mm mercilin tape on a swaged on or mayo needle is passed anteriorly to posteriorly. The tape is then directed posteriorly to anteriorly on the other side of the cervix. Alice clamps are placed so as not to bunch the cervical tissue. This diminishes the distance that the needle must travel submucosally and aids tape placement. The tape is snugly tied anteriorly after ensuring that all slack has been taken up. The cervical mucosa is then closed with continuous stitches of chromic suture to bury the anterior knot. 
We can also do a transabdominal circlage. We replace the suture on the uterine isthmus and this can be used if there are severe cervical anatomical defects or if there have been prior transvaginal circlage failure. Complications of circlage include membrane rupture, preterm labor, hemorrhage, infection, or combinations of these complications. Membrane rupture during suture placement or within the first 48 hours following surgery is an indication for circlage removal because of the likelihood of serious or maternal infection. So how do we evacuate the products of conception? It depends actually if the patient comes to you with a dilated or a non-dilated cervix or a closed cervix. If the patient comes to you with a closed cervix, then we have to ripen the cervix or give something to open the cervix so that we can evacuate the products of conception. Now, if the patient comes to you with a dilated cervix or an open cervix, then of course you don't have to do anything to dilate the cervix uh, further and you can proceed with the curettage. So in this table, that's table 18.7, we have some techniques here used for first trimester uh, evacuation of the products of conception. So we can do dilatation and curettage, vacuum aspiration, or menstrual aspiration. As for the medical, we can use uh, prostaglandins, um, antiprogesterones, methotrexate, or various combinations of the above. So for the table 18-8, we see here the comparisons of some advantages and drawbacks to medical versus surgical abortions. Actually, in, in reality, we mostly do surgical um, evacuation of the products of conception. However, uh, some prefer to do medical evacuation, especially if the pregnancy is very early, such as when the pregnancy is less than 8 weeks age of gestation. So we see here that laminaria is one of the ways by which we dilate the cervix. Laminaria is actually a seaweed which we insert into the cervical canal in order to absorb the water from the cervix and partially dilate the cervix so as we can access the cervical canal and easily insert the curettage instrument. We can also do a dilatation and curettage. And here, we see a metal dilator or a Heger's dilator to dilate the cervix. We usually do this under anesthesia because this is painful if we use the Heger's dilator to dilate the cervix. And then, once we've dilated the cervix, then we can start with a curettage or mechanical scraping out of the products of conception. For a mid trimester abortion, here are our or some of the techniques that we can use for evacuation of the products of conception. We can do a surgical or a medical evacuation, but usually we prefer doing a surgical evacuation in the form of a dilatation and curettage, dilatation and evacuation, uh, dilatation and extraction, or we can do a hysterotomy, especially if the um, pregnancy is far advanced uh, in the mid trimester. Can we give contraception following miscarriage or abortion? Yes. So unless another pregnancy is desired right away, effective contraception can be initiated very soon or as soon as possible after evacuating the products of conception. In fact, we can insert an IUD or an intrauterine device after the procedure is completed. Any of the various forms of hormonal contraception can be initiated um, during this time or right after the evacuation of the products of conception. For women who desire another pregnancies, sooner may be preferable to later. That's it for my lecture and thank you for watching my lecture. And please don't forget to subscribe in my YouTube channel, Ina Irabon, and my WordPress site, Dokina Obigayne. Thank you!